Adam Hamilton writes, and at first he quotes Jesus, uh, John 10, verse 10. Jesus said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Then he says this, he writes this. The devil doesn't need to tempt us to do things, to do drugs or to steal or to have an extramarital affair in order to destroy us. All he needs to do is convince us to keep pursuing the American dream, to keep up with the Joneses, borrow against our futures, enjoy more than we can afford and indulge ourselves. By doing that, he will rob us of joy, make us slaves and keep us from doing God's will. How's that for an introduction? Uh, we are starting a sermon series entitled Enough, Discovering Joy Through Simplicity and Generosity. There's a passage in Galatians that talks about freedom in Christ. It's not a list of rules, but it talks to our propensity to enslave our th ourselves to things that are not God. One of the ways that we do that is by how we spend our money. We're, this sermon series, we're not going on a guilt trip, right? We're not going to, you know, this, that's not where this is taking us. Uh, we're asking the questions, how can we live in ways that we're not stressed out, we're not losing sleep, we're not arguing with our loved ones about how we're spending our money. How can we know peace and joy in how we manage our finances? This, these topics, this, this sermon will preach in any age. Uh, where you know, this uh, Adam, Adam Hamilton, uh, who is the, uh, who prepared this, he did this sermon series in his church years ago, and he, uh, I use him as a springboard for, for doing this. And he, he did the sermon series right after the crash in 2007, where everybody was, you know, panicked about finances. Um, I did this sermon series with my former church. This was pre COVID. And now here we are in COVID. And so looking up how we are doing financially, uh, Today, during COVID, 14% of people, their finances improved during COVID. Better than, better than one in 10. But 42% worsened. And so that means that 44% remain the same. But again, I'm going to say this, this, is, this is timely. This, this stuff will preach any day. Uh, let's... First, acknowledge some of the things that, that were set, said in that introductory. We live in the United States where we were all raised on this American dream, which is to say, if we work hard, we will know success. But how do we judge success? And that's where we get caught because we judge success or we think of success as the stuff that we are able to accumulate, our possessions. Scripturally, we build bigger barns. Jesus tells a man who had so much, rather than thank God and be generous and be generous with the more than enough, he built a bigger barn. And in the U.S., we're impressed with that. But scripture tells us, and the spirit confirms, that those who store up treasures for themselves tend not to be rich towards God. They're serving another master. So how much is enough? which is a great question. How much until we feel secure, which is a different question. And that's another tricky question where we can get ourselves trapped. If our sense of security comes from how much money we have saved in the bank, we can, there, will there ever be enough? Or can we cre create scenarios in our head where we're gonna need more and more and more in order to feel secure? And then how do we live out of that space? Because that's a very fearful space. Jesus would say, look at the birds. Look at the flowers. See how God has provided for them. God will provide for you too. Breathe. Worrying doesn't help anything. Years ago, I knew a woman who stayed in a really, really awful relationship because she didn't want to leave her house and the standard of living. And I, and I said to her, God will provide. And uh, someone that I know and love, my mother said to me, well, you better hope that God does. 
very practical. And I said, I have absolutely no question in my mind that she will always have a, sh a roof over her head and clothes on her back and food in her belly, but it may not be how she likes it. Which leads us into, again, the trap of what's a need and what is a want. We would save ourselves a lot of heartache if we were better able to distinguish between what is a need and what is a want. Did you know that there are more self-storage facilities in the United States than McDonald's? By a lot. There are nearly four times as many self-storage facilities. That, which means, folks, we can't fit all our stuff in our houses. Years, uh, years ago, there's a magazine called Real Simple. I, I think it still exists, right? And I got drawn in by this, you know, real simple ways to, to store your, your Christmas decorations. So I opened it up. By the way, these are just the chains being broken. Like we'll just use that, that make that the metaphor. The chains, the chains and enslavers are being broken. Anyway, so the uh, in, I got drawn in by this article about how you know how to organize your your Christmas decorations. You want to know what their real simple idea was? Rent a self storage facility. Buy those plastic containers. Which and for those of us who love to organize, we love those things with you know with the label gun, right? And just you know, so just every year go standing there, organize them really nicely. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me! That's not real simple. That's real expensive. <laughs> the church that I just served, and and it's happening this weekend. They have. I know you all have had rummage sales here, and they have two rummage sales per year. And it's filled. It's amazing the stuff that shows up. And the whole community knows it. So everybody's just like, you know, chomping at the bit to be able to, to, to drop off their stuff. And everybody admits every year, it's so hard. You bring a car full of stuff and you try really hard not to leave with a car full of stuff. But it goes on and it's an incredible fundraiser for the church or for the women's group, right? But just unbelievable the amount of stuff that we can accumulate. And then we have this impulse problem and unwillingness to wait for, for gratification. And I looked this up and I'm just looking around. I'm guessing most of the people in the room know what layaway is, right? I don't, it's still a thing. Layaway was when you saw something that you wanted at the store, but you didn't have all the money. So you, put, you went to the layaway department and then you gave an installment. And then you would come back when you had more money. Your next paycheck, you would come until you could finally buy it. But there was like some, you had to work for it. Now, what do we have? Credit cards. Mm -hmm. Instant gratification. And I looked up the numbers for 2021. And depending, and the numbers change based on what website you go to. But New Jersey is either number two or down to number six, I think, in terms of average credit card debt. We're on, you know, on, on a, more than one site, we're number two. Uh, so I went with that number, but uh, we're beaten by Alaska. That's it. Yeah, makes me curious. But anyway, the average debt in the US is $6,270. Uh, New Jersey is 7,000. Gen X, 45 to 54. To 54 year olds have the highest credit card debt. I'm here to represent um, <laughs> that I don't have the credit card debt, but I'm in that age group. Men have more credit card debt than women. Average number of credit cards are four, which I do not believe includes all the retail cards. This, I always, these are always interesting. And this has improved in the last couple of years. And actually, if you look at, at the data, uh, some people were able to pay down their credit card debt during COVID, right? 40.7% don't pay off their credit card bills at the end of the month and pay the interest rates, almost 41%. The folks who are called transactionists or who are the people who just use this credit cards as convenience and pay off at the end of the month, um, they represent 33.7% and that has gone up in the last two years. But guess how much banks are making? In 2013, 
they made 76.3 billion on credit card, which is the, the interest rates and the fees and all of that stuff. In 2020, they made 176 billion. That's a difference of 100 billion in seven years. This doesn't include car loans, mortgages, student loans, any of that. So we have to contend, Christians, in the U.S. with, you know, with this idea that our, you know, our work ethic promises success. Success is judged not by our generosity, but by how much stuff we have. And a lot of, and a lot of folks try to live into that success by putting themselves in debt. We become slaves to the bank. Raising my kids in, uh, in Sparta, and, and Sparta is the well-to-do community up in Sussex County. And I would say to my kids, you know, uh, you know, visiting friends' homes, I'm like, you never know. People can have the biggest house and have the nicest cars, but you have no idea whether they can sleep at night or how much debt that they have or what, you know. And so, so looks are deceiving. And as adults, we need to remind ourselves of that too. So in this climate of affluenza, which is our desire to have more, bigger, better, and credititis, which is one instant gratification. Let's talk about freedom that comes with the relationship of God that off and offers us a different way. Jesus would say to us, you don't need all the stuff to feel good about yourself, to feel successful, to feel okay. Our security, wanting to belong, to feel okay, can lead us to ens enslave ourselves. And this, I have kept this. Um, yeah, you're gonna, it's, a, it's something I bought when I, my first church uh, was in Puerto Rico. And I ha had very little money. But one day I went to the mall and, and I bought this, I fell in love with this. And I got a little bit of a buzz from that, felt good about that, brought it home, set it up. And within 10 minutes, I remember saying to myself, and I still feel lonely. That was the hole that I was trying to fill. And that's one of the things, the traps that we can get into thinking that our stuff is going to make us feel better, but it's hollow. When I was in, when COVID hit, I was in, I was in Cuba uh, and had one of the nights that we were there, I was just reminded of when I was an exchange student in, in high school in, in a developing country where there's not a lot of stuff, but we just sat around uh, in, the, in the evening and a couple of people had guitars and we sang and we danced and there was jokes told and, and stories were told. And I remember thinking they're so rich in community, poor and stuff, but rich in community. And I think this, this is what we're longing for. And, and I wanna say, this is one of the gifts that churches can give to the larger community. Cause one of the, the one of the, and you read it again and again, loneliness is an epidemic. And churches, this, that community, if we can do that and do that well and offer a place for people to bring all that they are and not have to do the mask thing, but to bring all that they are and offer real community, that is an absolute gift that we can be giving in ministry. And it's the simplest thing. It doesn't cost a thing. And that's what people are longing for. One of the gifts of COVID is that recognition that what we long for more than anything is community. Um, and another thing that, that, that I experienced myself and a lot of people recognize as a gift of COVID, we got outside and we took walks. And I remember 
thinking to myself, I don't ever want this to change. I want to do this every day. And then of course I listen to a podcast or I read an article that says people, everybody is feeling the same way. We want to, yeah, we're going back to work, but we want to carve out space so that we can be outside because the riches of God's creation for our souls is abundant and it doesn't cost a thing. We had this calling to faithfulness and to simplicity. And in our simplicity, uh, Adam Hamilton wrote, writes about living below our means so that we can be generous. So we have this call to faithfulness, to simplicity, and, and to generosity. And in that space, we know joy, we know fulfillment, and we know freedom. These principles are not meant to, res to restrict us. They're meant to free us. It's a gift from God if we're willing to unwrap it. In Jesus' name, amen.